A note to our listeners before we get started. This story contains references to sexual abuse and suicide. Please listen with care. I'm Rob Cribb, and you're listening to The Ultimate Choice. Michael is very much on my mind. Before meeting him, I experienced the deaths of those around me, much like all of us do. People I love dearly have died, sometimes following lengthy battles with disease in ways many of us have witnessed. But I'm still trying to get my head around what it means to choose to die and how a doctor can help you with that. A few very simple words keep bouncing around my head since that bright summer weekend. Let's call it a day. That's what Michael said. And that's a whole new level for me. It got me thinking again about my dad, Jack, and how he wanted to call it a day for himself if he ever ended up in a situation like Michael's. I have a strong urge to head home to Halifax to talk to my mom, Nadia, about what actually happened when he told her he wanted to end his life. I'm not sure how you start a conversation like this, but let's strap in and see where we go. I remember you telling me that he had said this to you, that he wanted you to essentially assist in his death. But I I understood it was sort of sort of a one-time kind of conversation and it never went anywhere, but you, you're saying that he said this numerous times. Numerous, yes. I didn't know that. Like, how many times did he say that? Oh, God, I don't remember, but through life. I, this conversation comes up with friends, with people who have had that problems. And, and your dad would say to anybody, if, if the room was full of people, he would say, I told Nadia that if... If I go that way, I asked her and pleaded with her that she should give me some pills. I don't want to live that way. And there's no question in my mind that if it was legal and if it was he's able to make that decision, he wouldn't he wouldn't want to live that way. But it would have been murder, obviously, at that time. Yeah. So it was never even a consideration. It wasn't a, a realistic possibility no, no, for you. No, no, nothing. They, they, if that was mentioned in some countries, say, they were doing it, uh, people would laugh because, I mean, that's unthinkable to to choose to die. I mean, that was, the world wasn't like that. And for me to, I couldn't have done it, even if it was legal, I could not make that decision. Do you think before all of this, if I'd asked you this question 15 years ago, if I'd asked you this before Dad got sick, before you'd gone through all this, before you'd witnessed it all, what would you have said then? Definitely out, out of the question for me. You would, you would have said you would never do oh, it? Oh, never. Never consider it, no. But after living through it on everyday basis, and there's no guarantee how the day is going to go and what I'm going to be faced with, it changes you. So the reason that it's a yes today is because of what you witnessed? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. He didn't gain anything other than he was comfortable. So this podcast, as you know, looks at this emerging issue of assisted death. Canada has legalized it. In 2016, it became legal. It's further expanded. It's going to expand some more. So more and more people are going to be eligible this is a real moment in time where the country is going to effectively decide where we sit in this debate. Where do you think you sit in all of this? You support it, I think. I think I support it only if you have a disease that is not going to get better. 
a disease that is going to get worse and worse and worse. And then obviously at some point in life, you will die. I do not support it for people who are, they want to get out of the situation of their lives and they choose this. I do not support that. What about people with mental health challenges? What do you think about that? That's troubling. I don't know how I would feel about that. If I had somebody in my family, I I prefer not to go there and think about it's it. It's tricky. Right? It's very tricky. It's tricky. Yeah. Boy. This is my childhood home. This is where I spent my days growing up. From about junior kindergarten to grade eight, I lived here, and then I moved. Uh, uh, so I kind of just come out here to get away, because if I'm cooped up inside for too long, I start to get stir crazy, and being around my family for extended periods of time can be disheartening at best. So out here, I just come out here, and these guys just yell at me because they're hungry, not because they're expecting anything. Yes, I know. We've come out to Forest, Ontario, about a three-hour drive west of Toronto, to meet with Mason. He's been talking to us for months about his interest in MAID, but this is the first time we've met. So it was an old property that my dad picked up back in 2000. It's a hundred-some-odd-year-old barn, and all the wood is old enough to show it, too. Um, but then the guy that got the property tried building a house on top of it, and unfortunately it's lopsided. And it drives me nuts. <laughs> For Mason, the memories here are mostly positive. But there's another side to his story. There's a good chunk of positive memories. I think they're grossly overshadowed by the negative ones because of how impactful those ones are. But there's still a decent amount of positive ones that I can cling to and that kind of make staying here tolerable. Hey, you guys. She'll follow me around while I'm out doing chores and stuff. She just loves everybody. She wants to come up and say hi to everybody all the time. So because I bottle fed her all the time, she's just obsessed with me. And she's super soft too. All of them are. Just taking care of a small animal in general is just so good for you because it's that, kind of that unconditional love. Like this bottle bond is just because I gave her food, but she is obsessed with me. Every time I come out here, she comes looking for me. He walks us around the property, introducing us to the animals. Animals, he says, have helped him cope with the tough stuff in his life that the humans can't help him with. So, I gotta say, like, probably one of the best things that has helped my mental state since my life kind of fell apart is being able to have something to focus on. And just having something to take care of when you can't feel, when you feel like you can't take care of yourself is a huge boon to your mental health because it's that, it's showing something love. If you can't show yourself love, you can at least show an adorable, pudgy, soft lamb. Mason took the train into Toronto to meet up with us so we could keep talking about his struggles with depression and a very volatile family life. He was blunt but thoughtful at the same time. I think I kind of got dealt a bad hand and wasn't really given an option to mulligan. I have to give you all a heads up here. Mason says he's kind of desensitized in the way he talks about his life and it can get pretty dark but we want you to hear his point of view. This is his life, his story to tell, but listen with care. The mind forgets, but the body remembers. I'm just trying to think back on to what moments have kind of caused this, and I can't, I don't have like a filing system in my head for all, where all this stuff goes. I just remember that, that they have happened within like a time frame. He uses words like chaos and total lack of control to describe his tense family life. And there's a deep sense of dread that he can't cope. 
You have attempted suicide 15 times. How old were you the first time? Seven. Seven years old? Seven years old, yeah. How would this enter into your head as a seven-year-old that you wanted to end your life? I couldn't even tell you. I can't remember that far back. I just remember that I, I felt such an insurmountable feeling of pain that wasn't physical. I couldn't figure out where it was. It just, it was like I was seeping pain and I couldn't figure out where from and it just needed to stop. How did you, how did you attempt it? Um, there was a knife for one, tried going across my jugular, tried hanging myself, tried jumping off a bridge. Actually, ironically enough, when I was taking the train into Toronto, we went through Kitchener and passed under one of the bridges that I tried jumping off of. Did you jump? Oh, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't as high as I thought it was. Then, in January 2023, the wheels came off. So you were in London, you moved in with your fiancé. It sounded like things were going pretty well. You got a job, you're managing this building. Um, you're living together in the building. What happened that day? I asked her if we could take a trip up to the beer store so I could swap out my empty case for a new one. And somewhere from grabbing the empty case and bringing it to the front door, I just slid into this anxiety spiral. And I couldn't get myself out of it. I just panicked and I went into the bathroom and she immediately got on the phone with the police. She said, you know what, this is the last time that we're doing this. I can't be worried about you all the time. We have to do something about your mental health. Mason tells me all he remembers is a desperate need to get out, to leave the apartment building. But somewhere between throwing some stuff together in a bag and saying goodbye, the police arrive. So I was getting ready to go out the patio when I decided to turn around and say goodbye to my cats. And then the cops walked through the front door and I explained to them what was going on. And they, uh, I went with them willingly. They didn't put me in cuffs or anything. They took me to the hospital. Mason was apprehended under the Mental Health Act and spent time in hospital. There was a split with his fiance. But he was convinced that things might actually turn around now that he had hit rock bottom. Maybe the right treatments would finally come along. The right doctors. But it turned out to be wishful thinking. That's usually been a rinse and repeat of trying a combination of the right medication with the right therapist. And it's very few and far between that you find a matchup of both. When did you first become aware of MAID? I knew it was a thing for terminal illnesses, but it wasn't until I got out of the hospital that I started looking for um, government-assisted suicide. And I think that's what I Googled when I came across MAID. So help us understand this. You're a 27-year-old guy. You're healthy. Um, you have a life ahead of you. Why? Why would you even ponder for a moment this notion of asking a physician to assist you to die? Mainly the mess. I didn't want to have to have somebody clean me up if I was going to kill myself. I figured that's the biggest kind of stigmatism with mental health is that a lot of it leads to suicide and a lot of it is left for, you know, big headlines of guy that jumped off bridge or guy that jumped off building. Um, that was one of my big things that I, I really didn't want somebody else to have to clean me up. Sitting there listening to Mason... I'm trying my best to understand, but I'm getting stuck. What would need to happen for you to take this off the table, to, to say, no, I'm not, I am no longer interested in going down this road? I've never been asked that before. Honestly, at this point, I don't even really know what that looks like. Because I kind of had everything that I thought I needed and I was still unhappy in such a core level. So I don't know what more I could possibly get out of life that could make me at least, or that could at least give me a sense of purpose or meaning. You can't even see anything? No. And it's just 
Like everything that I've ever had as an ambition or a dream usually turns into a fantasy. And it's usually just because I've, like I've said, I've lived with one foot out the door for most of my life. Mason's story is just one example of the growing demand for medically assisted death in Canada. Under the current laws, he's not eligible, but he's determined and hopeful. For those who are eligible now, there's already tens of thousands of people who have chosen to end their lives this way. As we launch this podcast, made deaths account for more than 4% of all deaths in Canada. As a reporter covering this issue for many years, even I can't quite believe the data. We compared Canada to countries that have had these laws way longer, and the line on the graph shows Canada spiking upward past them all. It threw me. I needed to check in with someone who spent years looking at the countries that have already grappled with this for decades before Canada. So I got on a plane to Washington, D.C. I met up with my producers, Suzanne and Bruce, to visit the National Institutes of Health. But first, we had to get inside. This is harder than getting into Canada, which is not easy. Where do you want us to go? Get a phone to the side. Okay, there's a thing. Jeez. God, we came early. Wow, more cop cars here than the. Wow. They said they said that, that we could park there, right? Because it's a holiday. She thought we could park right there. Probably not. The ambulance yeah. scooped the baby down on the street. Yeah. Right. Police escort. Wow, and he's got the lights. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Once you get through, they trust you. They help. Hi, are you Yvonne? Yes, I'm Yvonne. I'm Ron. Nice to meet you. And you. It's impressive security. It's a fortress here. Hello. Scott? Hey. How are you? Rob Crib. Terrific. I thought this is all remote. Suzanne Reber. Nice to meet you. Okay, so I'm going to put this here then. Is this all right? Uh, my name is Scott Kim. I am a bioethicist, philosopher, as well as a psychiatrist with about 20 years of clinical experience in psychiatry. And one of my main areas of research is assisted dying practices and laws, uh, especially psychiatric cases. All right. So we've come to you uh, at the end, really, of a very long journey of researching. We've been looking at this issue of MAID in Canada for a very long time. And... One of the paths that we went down is trying to look at what's happening in Canada against the international spectrum. So we've been digging into that and started gathering data on assisted deaths around the world, and we started graphing it. And we saw this striking line, this sharply increasing line uh, for Canada that appears to be outpacing every other jurisdiction. I'm, I'm curious how this particular subject matter became a focus for you. Why, why do you start caring so much about assisted death? So this issue of assisted dying it has been a perennial issue in the field for decades. So it's always been a, a topic I was interested in. Um, Dr. Kim tells me that the cases that stood out to him were people who want to get help in dying, not because they have a terminal illness, psychiatric euthanasia meaning but solely because they have a psychiatric disorder and no longer want to live i started reading more and that's when i started doing research in the country that is the most transparent about its practice that's the netherlands so i um, started reading these case records and they were very striking 
and as both as a bioethicist, especially as a clinician. Would you say they were striking? How so? What was striking to you about them? At first, I thought these would be really exceptional cases of people that everybody would see as, wow, this is unusual. But there are many aspects of the practice I hadn't anticipated because virtually all of them were recognizable to me as patients I would come across in my practice or if I were on As call, I was sitting there listening, the first person that came to my mind was Mason. There is always a paradigm case, right? At the end of life, people think about a person. They're in excruciating pain. Doctors can't do anything. Palliative care is insufficient, and the patient should be given compassionate end to their life. I think that's the paradigm case. Um, but what I was really surprised by is if you look at the data, um, how many people with autism, mild autism, apply for and qualify. Um, there was a woman who lost her husband, and they had a very, very close relationship. And within a year, about a year after his death, the doctors granted a request for euthanasia, and their diagnosis was prolonged grief. Broken heart. Yeah, a very severe case of broken heart, actually. But obviously, to use a overly medicalized model for a situation like that is tough. I think that's one of the big differences between what we think we're doing when we debate the legalization and the reality of what you'll end up seeing in the clinic or in the consultation room when patients come to you. And so what you're saying is, based on the Netherlands experience, which is much longer, we may be looking at scenarios where increasingly the people applying for and receiving aren't dying at all. Is that, is that, have I got that right? Yes. There's a very important feature of the Canadian law that I would propose is radically different from even the very liberal laws in the Netherlands and Belgium. And it's the following. When the original law was written, people understood this is kind of end of life issue. Now, if you think about the decision of whether you want to continue living, what we would usually have call suicidal thoughts, right? <laughs> that doesn't occur to people unless they're in a very difficult situation, right? Well, Mental illness is one of the most common sources. And if your illness is severe enough where you're having those thoughts, chances are your employment is compromised, your relationships might be difficult, you might be socially isolated, you might not have a whole lot of social supports, and your society kind of stigmatizes the whole concept of mental illness. So these folks are highly vulnerable in terms of how they perceive the world in relation to the question about, is life worth living, right? So there, as we know, why is it that for mental health care, there is subpar, kind of second-class citizen status in terms of provision of needed treatments? Um, somebody made an equality argument to say you got to apply to whatever. You know, equality is a double-edged sword, right? If you're going to have equality of access to this, maybe you should have equality of access to other things too. So the thing that kind of worries me about the Canadian public debate over this is that there hasn't been sufficient reckoning. I think the simplest way for people to understand this is the distinction between the laws in Canada and those in the Netherlands and Belgium. The Dutch and Belgium laws allow assisted death only as a last resort option. Not so in Canada. There hasn't been the kind of robust public debate and public input about 
the kind of society you're likely to create or are creating. Look, in six years, you're already caught up to what it took 50 years or 40 some years in Netherlands in terms of number of people who use MADE. Um, these are legitimate requests by people who are saying, oh, this is what I want. So why are there so many requests? I, I think it's because there is a culture of seeing it, looking at it as a alternative medical treatment not as a tragic last option. By having that law, it gives the medical system and your social political system an out when you abandon people. So one person's empowerment is another person's abandonment. And Canada has another major distinction, a universal health care system delivering made. There's been a very organized, concerted effort to roll this out as this new kind of thing that we need to make available as another medical option. Not as a last resort option, but on par with everything else. So I think that really makes the entire health system an instrument in spreading the word. In that way, it's very, very unusual, right? It has these intersections of unusualness, you might say, that makes Canada kind of a unicorn. Dr. Kim was part of an expert panel to advise the Canadian government on MAID for mental disorders. You had a bit of an inside look at all of this. Um, when I uh, agreed to be on the panel, yeah. uh, they make you sign a confidentiality agreement. It's so bizarre because a lot of these bodies that you guys have, like this working group that produced these documents, it was all done in secret. Oh, really? That's weird. It is freaking weird. Um, <laughs> and I could be mistaken. And, you know, if you ask me, I, I'll still answer the question to my best ability. But I was so naive going into it that um, I swore I wasn't going to get in further involved with the Canadian process. But then I get called back over and over. So I do get sucked back in. You know, we'd be sitting at a banquet table and talking about this very issue, you know, if you don't provide whatever, you know, people could be asking this for poverty as a reason for MAID. And then you'd have a panel member go, well, that's an interesting question. Let's talk about that. Should we allow, is poverty, is that a legitimate reason for, you know? I mean, they were seriously, and I thought they were joking, you know? And then I said, you know, how about, don't you think you need to delay whatever it goes? Well, you know, you can't delay things forever. So uh, the process was very kind of the back room type stuff that was so predominant in the process of what goes into the report and not is uh, something I'd never been part of. It does feel a little bit like there is a remarkable social experiment unfolding in Canada around this issue. Oh, I think that's without a doubt. Really? Oh, yeah. I think it's a it, it's an experiment because the contours of what's happening is very much kind of a top-down model, you might say. Kind of the idea of the this being a human right idea that this is conceptualized as a medically effective treatment. I think no one disputes that this is the kind of policy that many countries are now adopting. The question really is how you do it. There, wh wh why is there a need to be ideological? You know, I mean, it seems like this should be transparent. When we left Dr. Kim's office, all of us were exhausted. 
I felt like I had just been confronted all over again with the deep complexities at the intersection of government policy and the desperate choices of people like Michael and Mason and the growing numbers of Canadians like them. The line in the graph just keeps climbing. Are we really ready for this kind of massive societal change? Even lawmakers seem unsure. Just as we were about to release this podcast, it looked like the Canadian government would walk things back yet again. We agree with the conclusion uh, that the committee has come to, uh, that the system is at this time not ready, uh, and more time is required. Will the Prime Minister finally listen to the experts, finally listen to vulnerable Canadians, and press pause on this deeply flawed, made expansion? What's the backstory to all that hand-wringing? We'll take you behind the scenes with the people at the heart of advising Canada on MADE. That's coming up next time. This season of The Ultimate Choice is reported by me, Rob Cribb. Written by Suzanne Reber and myself, and produced by Suzanne Reber and Bruce Edwards, who also mixed and sound designed our show. Alison Leighton Brown composed our theme and original music. Field recordings by Damian Kearns, Ian Thompson, and Bruce Edwards. Jess Alvarenga is our associate producer. Additional reporting by Massey Kalibari, Declan Keogh, and Max Laszlo at the Investigative Journalism Bureau. The Ultimate Choice was created by our executive producer, Suzanne Reber. Our show is a production of TVO Today in partnership with Pitt's Gloria Productions, the Investigative Journalism Bureau, and the Toronto Star. Our team at TVO includes Shahayar Tajvidi, Managing Editor of Podcasts and Digital Video, Lori Few, Executive Producer of Digital, and John Ferry, Vice President of Programming and Content. And special thanks to Anne-Marie Owens, Editor of the Toronto Star. If you enjoyed listening to The Ultimate Choice and believe in this kind of deeply reported and immersive storytelling, we'd be grateful if you give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening.